internet participants, uh, we have already, uh, I would say, managed to invite many vulnerable guests all around the world, but also from Europe. We have 200 people online right now, so it's quite a lot. Uh, we also would like to uh, um, welcome people from, from the ministry and thank you, sir, for uh, leading this uh, uh, webinar, which is, in my opinion, extremely um, on time. Why it's on time? Right now, uh, the government of India uh, and Ministry of uh, New and Renewable Energy is working, actually developed the policy of PV recycling, and it's uh, under uh, public discussion, public consultation. The uh, final uh, version or version uh, for uh, public participation will be revealed soon. Uh, it means that as much, uh, we, we should gather as much good uh, knowledge as possible and this is why the uh, webinar is so, uh, is so important, so timely. Uh, uh, the webinar uh, is organized uh, uh, actually, I would say by the ministry, because we are an EU India Technical Cooperation project, but this is joint venture between Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and uh, European uh, Commission. So uh, let me pass the uh, uh, floor to uh, Sri Anand Kumar. Uh, 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 the Secretary of Ministry and uh, of New and Renewable Energy. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Marek Zabrowski <laughs> uh, from EU India uh, and uh, our friends, uh, Mr. Rafael Gruzi uh, from Solar Power Europe, Ms. Nako Tozo and uh, Mr. Edwin, Council of European Union Delegation to India, uh, friends uh, who are participating in this uh, webinar from around the world. As uh, you all are aware, uh, India has set a target of installing 165 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity by the year 2022. And uh, recently, our Honorable Prime Minister has announced by 2030, uh, we should establish at least 450 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity. And he made this mention at the United Nations Climate Action Summit. So for India, uh, fighting against the climate change is a matter of faith and commitment. And we all, all are dedicated to the cause of action against climate change. On the, we are dedicated for action, not for action against climate change. Pardon me for, uh, for making the wrong phrase earlier on. Uh, and out of this 175 gigawatt, which we had achieved by 2022, 100 uh, gigawatts would come uh, from solar power and out of 450 gigawatt by uh, 2030, at least 325 uh, would come from solar power. This is what we estimate. In order to achieve uh, this ambitious plan of installing our capacity, we need to shift our focus uh, to modern approaches, to new technologies, and for recycling, the waste which will be generated after 25, 30 years, and we are partnering with the European Union as so that there is no damage, no serious damage or no damage whatsoever is caused to the environment. We all are concerned about the environment. We all would like to leave uh, the environment for future generations without any adverse impact. However, as we double the capacity by 2030, when I'm referring to the year 2022, 175, and then moving on to the figure of 450 by 2030. 
uh, we feel that the PV waste volume which we generate in India, uh, it would grow to 200,000 tons by 2030. And it is estimated that by 2050, it may go to around 1.8 million tons. India is a global leader in renewable energy capacity addition and is aiming to lead in its sustainable implementation. Hence, we pursue for recycling of solar PV very, very seriously. The effective implementation of PV recycling will require two perspectives. One, sustainable design to reduce the environmental impact of the solar PV waste, that is, reducing the use of hazardous materials, easy dismantling for recycling. And second, I may not say, is the recycling to recover the resources and materials. The European Union is our technical partner in this exercise which will ensure recycling of solar beams. Today, we are having the first edition of the webinar and we will now be having a subsequent and series of editions of this webinar series. And thank you very much, Mark, once again. Marek, once again. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to deliberation on this webinar and uh, and, and the subsequent uh, webinar uh, editions of this series, series on uh, reducing the solar PV waste and also PV recycling the materials which will be generated by the same solar PV. Thank you. Thank you uh, for, for this inspiring introduction and I, I think very important and uh, strongly sound words that uh, uh, actually the, the waste problem is not only the problem of the waste of recycling but also design and handling yes. for, uh, for, for the future. Uh, maybe I will slowly go to the, to the, uh, to the presentations. But before I will go to the presentation, I, I would like to explain to everybody who is already logged in how to uh, cooperate with us. So uh, we will have uh, three presentations. Uh, and uh, during each presentation, each and every uh, participant uh, would take uh, uh, send us uh, questions. And there is a special section on the screen uh, button where you can uh, just press and send the, uh, the question. Uh, please do not uh, mi mix it with the chat. Use uh, the, this uh, particular service for questions. Later, uh, my colleague Atul uh, will select uh, two questions and these questions will be answered by uh, uh, speakers. So altogether, we we plan that four, maybe six questions will be answered by speakers, and it will take more or less ten minutes. After this ten minutes, we we are planning to have some closure uh, remarks, and these closure remarks can be uh, given by uh, our host uh, in means the ministry and also uh, by EU delegation. I will introduce uh, our uh, guests, we are, which, we are, uh, which are sitting here in a moment. And later, we will just close our webinar. It will take altogether like one hour, 15 minutes, maybe one hour, 20 minutes. But if it's necessary, uh, we can, of course, uh, extend it. We are free uh, if the room is free and you are free if, and everybody feels that we, we should stay here longer, we can do it. But uh, the plan is to, to keep to the time. And after this uh, um, webinar, which will be available for everybody, we also would like to, we will have 15 minutes of uh, uh, a closed session for for the ministry. If minister, minister would like to uh, raise some uh, some questions to to experts, so uh, 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 this is this is the technical. Yes, sir. 
I should speak louder. Okay, I can. I, I'm sorry. There, there was a technical issue. I should speak louder, so I will speak louder. Uh, uh, we have already uh, uh, very honourable uh, participants here, and I have a list of participants at the moment. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as uh, actually I, I have already introduced Mr. Uh, Sri Anand Kumar, Secretary of MNR. Uh, also, we are proud to, to have here uh, Mr. Praveen Kumar, additional secretary of MNR. And also we have uh, Amitesh Sina, joint secretary of MNR. What does it mean? It means that this is <coughs> extremely high level meeting. This is something what uh, uh, it's very rare to, to have such a uh, wonderful representation and fully involved people uh, in, in such, uh, uh, I would say, working uh, uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have other uh, officials for, for, from the ministry and uh, from the uh, side of European Commission, we have Edwin, Edwin Kuku, who is, uh, who is a, a, a councillor of EU delegation to India, a councillor of energy and climate change. Yes? Hopefully, I haven't missed, right. missed, missed uh, Mr. Marek, I have to go for an important meeting. And in my absence, my colleague, Mr. Praveen Kumar, additional secretary, uh, would be with you. Mm. Sir, thank you once more for giving us uh, the chance to uh, to work for you and to to Thank work you with very such much. important and things. and we look forward uh, to the suggestions that would come out uh, of this webinar. Thank Super. you very much. Thank you. So yes. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. So right now we are uh, changing uh, the the seat, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Uh, Anand Kumar is leaving the, the room. Uh, you have to remember that secretary means that he is a, a, a in fact uh, believe, vice minister. Okay, he's going to the parliament. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, on behalf of the ministry, Mr. Uh, Pravin Kumar will uh, will be present because there is nothing to lead at, the, at this moment. So, uh, uh, going forward with the technicalities, actually, I would like to ask uh, uh, my my colleague Rinal to to go to the to the next slide, if you don't mind. Uh, can we? Ah, I cannot see the next slide. I'm sorry, we are organizing this uh, kind of thing first time. So, so, uh, okay. So, uh, just I wanted to uh, provide some context for 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 the discussion. Uh, this is uh, something what we can say uh, the TV waste challenge. What does it mean? It means that uh, actually I pro portrayed. Uh, the words of uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, India has very, very ambitious target to install at least 100 gigawatts of solar, uh, PV solar capacity. And uh, I asked my colleague uh, to multiply this 100, uh, 100 by uh, weight of, of a panel. And we've got almost 8 million tons of future waste. Of course, this waste is not going to be pro produced uh, uh, right now, but in the future. And on this slide, you can also see the current production of uh, e-waste. E-waste, it means electronic waste. Uh, usually in uh, Europe, PV waste is characterized, is categorized as a e-waste. So uh, currently in India, India produces 2 million tons of, of uh, e-waste a year. So it means that uh, uh, actually our uh, uh, PV systems 
are going to generate more or less three times more uh, waste than uh, actually is generated per, per year. This is a huge problem. And also on the same slide, you can see the uh, level of uh, uh, extraction of the uh, e-waste from, uh, uh, from the waste stream. It means recycle, 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 I'm sorry, how much waste is recycled. So actually right now, uh, only less than 2% of waste, electronic waste is recycled in India. It means that uh, if we add to this uh, 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 already unprocessed unpro waste, uh, another waste coming from uh, PV waste, it, uh, it will only uh, make uh, problem worse. Uh, just for uh, uh, for the record, in uh, uh, Sweden, for example, in Sweden, 67% of e-waste is recycled. Uh, okay, next slide, please. And uh, this is uh, the, the next slide uh, is even um, maybe it's not more striking, but it's very interesting. This is. Uh, uh, there are, uh, this is the set of data generated or provided by IRENA and uh, uh, Bridge to India. And this slide uh, shows the difference between degradation of Indian panels uh, uh, in front of uh, degradation of the panels in other world, uh, places on, uh, on, on the world. So it means that uh, Indian panels can uh, uh, degrade in much faster than it's, it is expected. It has multiple uh, consequences. Uh, actually, we already have some data from Mumbai Institute that degradation is more uh, than 2% a year. Uh, so it's, it has some uh, uh, financial consequences, but also it means that waste will come here. So uh, 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 please uh, uh, provide the next slide. Um, the next slide is about our honorable guests. Uh, actually, not guests, but uh, lecturers, our partners, sorry for guests. So, uh, the uh, the web webinar is organized in cooperation with Solar Power Europe. Solar Power Europe is one of the most powerful, uh, important uh, solar uh, power uh, producers, manufacturers, vendors, organization from Europe. Uh, and we are happy to have Rafael Rossi, who already is a analyst, uh, policy analyst in Solar Power Europe. Uh, he uh, worked also on a flagship report of the Solar Power Europe. It's a global market outlook for solar power. And also we, uh, the, the second uh, in the row uh, lecture, Ms. Naoko Tojo uh, uh, is a professor uh, from the Lund University, uh, and uh, Lund is in Sweden. Sweden is famous in Europe because they claim that they already reached 99% of recycling in, in their country. This is very 99. It's almost, I don't know how they done it, but anyway, this is what, uh, what is claimed. And um, uh, Naoko already knows uh, Indian market. Uh, she already worked uh, on some on that studies uh, on something what is called EPR. Uh, EPR mean, means uh, uh, consumer res responsibility. She will talk about it uh, uh, later. So uh, I would like to uh, give floor to Raphael. Uh, 15 minutes, and I will try to control the time. So if Rafael will uh, exceed the uh, time, I will mute him. This is, uh, this is my, my 
uh, approach to, uh, to exceeding time. So please keep, uh, keep uh, time uh, in laces. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can, can Rafael, you can start sharing the screen and uh, yeah. can uh, do we have uh, louder? Thank you for the presentation. I hope you can hear me fine. And I hope you can also see my screen. Please confirm if this is the case. Hello. Yes, I can. I can see. <laughs> thank you very. Side. Thank you very much. Just to confirm that also the other participants can see the screen. Yes, I feel it's uh, all right. Go ahead. Perfect. Then I will go on with my presentation. So, uh, thanks so much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm pleased to be here representing Solar Power Europe. Uh, just a few words about our organization. Solar Power Europe is uh, the EU Solar Industry Association, and we have more than 200 members uh, all across the solar value chain. And our aim is to shape the policy environment in in the EU to to support further solar deployment. So I said I'm really pleased to to join this webinar. Um, and I would like also to highlight that we and our members uh, consider India as a very interesting market. So looking forward to, to discussing this together. So today's presentation will focus on what brings the EU policymakers to address the issue of solar recycling. Um, what is the, a priority? Why is this a priority in the legislator's view? What are the advantages that this leads to? And finally, uh, what are the issues that, uh, that it intends to, to tackle? So what I would like to present today, um, first of all, I, I will look at the role of solar as a provider of sustainable solutions. Then I will move on and discuss why it is important to address uh, solar end-of-life management from a policymaker perspective. Um, I will also touch upon some market trends in Europe to, to give some context to the scale of the PV market. And then we will all see how, how this uh, all feeds into PV recycling issues. Uh, and finally, uh, how the EU policymakers see their role in encouraging PV recycling. Right. So um, I will start with uh, this. So one one of the strongest advantages of solar in comparison to conventional energy sources clearly lies in its sustainable performance. Throughout its entire lifetime, which includes manufacturing and of life. Uh, solar generates just a tiny fraction of the carbon emissions that are generated by fossil fuels such as gas and coal, but in general, um, conventional uh, power generation sources. This has been the main reason why several countries across Europe uh, have been among the front runners of solar deployment and, and why they have promoted solar energy as a means to transition to a low carbon and sustainable energy system. And indeed, Thanks to uh, rapid and continuous technological improvements, solar uh, across its uh, full life cycle now generates around 20 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Although the environmental footprint associated with solar power is extremely low uh, compared to, to conventional energy sources, as you can see from the graph, solar panels are indeed an industrial product and as such have a relative impact on the environment. Um, across the life cycle, most of the environmental impacts are related to the manufacturing stage due to the usage of um, raw materials and, and electricity and, and at the end of life stage. Therefore, uh, in order to, to, to reduce natural resource use and, and, and other environmental impacts, uh, we have the possibility to optimize the usage of the resources in a, in a circular way. Now let's, uh, let's have a, a quick look at some uh, market historical data and future trends so that we can put this into context. Um, so as mentioned, since the light, late 1990s, the uh, EU has been an early adopter of solar, and this has led in uh, significant volumes installed between 2008 and 2012. After this period, though, the, the user market has, uh, has seen a stagnation period uh, with annual installation bit flexible but stabilizing more or less below 10 gigawatts a year. 
Um, how, however, it's important to, to acknowledge that this has come to an end in 2018 when the market has had its best performance in the last five years. Um, the reasons are well, policy change and a steep increase in cost are, are playing a key role uh, in the steep installation growth uh, we are seeing this year. So this is also expected to continue steadily in the next five years and, and more generally in the future. And as you can see from the last bar of the graph, by 2023, the annual market will be already in the range of 30 gigawatts a year. Um, and if we look in a longer term perspective, the installation are set to grow exponentially uh, to make solar the backbone of the, of the new energy system. What is important for, for our talk today uh, are the cumulative installations. Uh, so, uh, looking at, at, at this graph, the two main takeaways that uh, I would like to, to get are, uh, well, first, you can see that a significant volume of installation starts to exist from the late 2000s, so when, when the installation uh, started being uh, significant. And second, that installations are set to grow at a much more rapid pace than what has been in the past. In only five years, total installation, according to our estimate, will double. So from 125 gigawatts to 200 gigawatts already in 2023. And sustained growth, it's, uh, as mentioned, is expected long term in order, uh, since in order to, to achieve high decarbonization, uh, a terawatt scale capacity needs to be installed. Now, what does this growth mean for PV recycling? Uh, in the short term, clearly, this has a limited impact. And, and the reason, uh, is, as you know, is that PV system have a quite long operational lifetime. And compared to other electronics that are covered in the regulations that we are gonna talk about, uh, so like white goods or mobile phones, solar panels have a re relatively long, long lifetime. So we are assessing towards 30 years of warranted lifetime. It is only after this period that they will enter the waste stream. For this reason, despite the fact that the EU has been an early adopter of solar energy, we're still dealing with a marginal amount of waste. Um, and this is even more the case in India where, where the development has been uh, very rapid, but more recent. So according to a study from, from IEA, PV, PS, and IRENA that was already mentioned in, in, in the slides from uh, for in, during the introductory remarks before, uh, in 2020, the ratio between panels reaching their end of life and the panels annually installed will be lower than 1%. So this is not a short-term urgent challenge, but rather a long-term big challenge. Uh, as you can see, like uh, the ratio will, will grow considerably, uh, mostly after 2030, and we will reach about 20, uh, 40 percent. Sorry, in 2040, uh, and at some point, we'll eventually reach installation levels. Of course, besides the oper normal operational lifetime, PV panels can be subject to early failure. Um, uh, however, there is a lot of uncertainty when making assumption about early failures. The change in technology for instance and also quality improvements through time uh, other uh, factors to to take into account are the lack of data of on early failures and the fact that early failures could not be detected or even could be tolerated for years before before replacing them so in in all in all it's uh, it's difficult to to assess this uh, this ratio and and to to understand how many how much waste stream will will we have in the future but we know that the challenge is there so let's now have a, a look at PV recycling from a policymaker perspective. So first of all, circular economy strategy is one of the political priorities of the European Commission. And this has been highlighted in uh, the EU industrial policy strategy, which was presented by President Juncker in the State of the Union address in 2017. Notably, this strategy stresses the importance of adapting to changes brought on by the transition to a low-carbon and more circular economy, as well as the strategic importance of raw materials for the EU manufacturing industry. It can be observed as well that circular economy related to solar is seen as a priority in light of the decision of the European Commission to launch a study on sustainable product policy tools to enhance material efficiency and circular economy aspects of products, 
at the current stage, there are a number of policy measures that are both mandatory and voluntary that are under scrutiny uh, in a preparatory study and might be implemented in the European market. And these instruments include, for instance, the eco-label and green public procurement. And in the eyes of the commission, they should provide a stronger incentive to efficient design for recycling and, and sound of, uh, end of life management practice. And then another issue is um, critical raw materials and uh, precious metal, metals. There, there are a number of uh, CRM, so critical raw materials, uh, and precious metals, and they, they include uh, silicon and silver, which are used in the manufacturing of conventional solar panels, so crystalline silicon panels. However, uh, as you know, there are other uh, technologies uh, that can make solar, and so there are other materials, which include, for instance, gallium, uh, indium, that are used in, uh, in manufacturing of other solar technologies. What is interesting is that most of these critical raw materials and precious metals are scarcely present in Europe. And this fact indeed might pose a challenge to scaling up domestic production for solar. So from a policymaker perspective, this can be an opportunity to reduce the risk of bottlenecks along, along the supply chain. Moreover, uh, the global availability of these materials is limited. Indeed, we live in a constrained world. Therefore, optimizing their use and being able to loop them back into the supply chain is, is a necessary action to ensure long-term sustainability of the PV industry uh, at large. Um, this will be my second last slide, or last slide, if you will. Uh, so I hope I'm still making it on time. So all in all, the importance of optimizing resource efficiency through looping waste streams back into the chain can be linked to two main aspects. The first one is related to the EU industrial strategy from um, a long industrial base in uh, renewable energy manufacturing and, uh, and, new, and new technologies. So it can provide, on the one hand, the cost savings, such as lower cost for manufacturing and procurement, so competitive advantage for, for the industry. It allows for job creation, uh, which is very important uh, in a continent like Europe, um, and setting up new business models related to end-of-life management. And as well, it provides access to raw materials, especially critical raw materials and precious metals, which are, as said, strategically important for Europe. And then there is a second group of aspects that are important for, for PV recycling um, in a policymaker perspective. So connected to, to solar environmental footprint, indeed, uh, reducing end-of-life impacts and in turn reducing manufacturing impacts through the use of recycled materials are a key aspect to ensure that solar continuously improves its environmental performance. So to conclude, Growing PV panel waste presents a big sustainability challenge, a long-term challenge, but also presents large opportunities to create economic value and to, and to increase solar's environmental performance. Um, and it, it is an important matter that would be fundamental in a, in a sustainable, uh, renewable energy-based future. This uh, is what I wanted to say for now, so I will, I will pass it on to, to the next speaker, and thank you very much. And, just these are the reference of what I was talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raphael, for, uh, I think, wonderful summary of, uh, of the situation in Europe, about uh, the summary of the problem. Uh, I would like to underline that uh, Solar Power Europe is an association of technology providers. So I think that we can uh, provide very good examples to, to, to India of leading technologies. And actually, this is something what we uh, plan also to, uh, to do. We, we, we would like to uh, organize a study tour uh, uh, for, for uh, I would say energy, uh, PV recycling leaders, uh, ministry, decision makers, 
just to see these technologies. And you have to understand that uh, Europe already have a lead, but the center of the problem is in Asia. It's not a problem, actually. The center of the renewable energy. It's a beauty, beauty of, of the situation because already uh, the growth is huge, but uh, we, uh, we have also some limited uh, role. This is something that I, at least I understand, maybe later uh, uh, we will discuss about it. So, uh, also I would like to uh, kindly ask you to provide uh, questions uh, if you have any to our uh, uh, lecture uh, questions you can uh, provide uh, through special uh, button uh, Q uh, and A. So uh, uh, I, uh, I would like to ask next um, person, Professor Naoko Tojo, uh, to provide uh, insight about uh, implementation, actually, technicalities of the implementation of European uh, policies. Uh, I am trying to share my slide. Uh, do you well, see? We can see it. We can see it. Thank you. You can see it. Excellent. Then, of course, it is at the end, but let me see. I go back and I start. Do you see the slides? Um, make it. Uh, bigger, just put it as a full presentation, sure. show, yes, yeah, slideshow. Uh -huh. uh, it's okay. I, uh, I have difficulty in showing the slides and seeing the slide myself, so I think I should stay with this. I hope it is okay. I can... Uh, Try one more time. Okay, do you see the slides? Yes, we can see them. Excellent, then I go. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. Uh, it is really my pleasure and honor to be able to contribute to this. Um, I am Naoko Tojo, as kindly introduced uh, by at the introduction. Uh, I work for Lund University. Lund is at the southern part of Sweden and at the institute we work called in, the institute is called International Institute for Industrial and Environmental Economics as, and as the name suggests we are trying to find a solution for the society to go forward with the uh, circular and low carbon economy uh, and especially looking at how we can help and push and change the, the behavior of the industry so that we can have a better sort of sustainable society. My particular focus has been very much on product related policies and law and especially in relation to end of life or management aspects and that is the talk of today. I start by talking about producer extended producer responsibility short for EPR and electronics and then uh, I will move forward with the specific specifics specific sorry aspects related to Europe and which is called uh, and something called we directive that probably many of you are familiar with waste electrical and electronic equipment directive and what is its direct implication to the uh, solar industry at the moment. Um, when we talk in general, very general trend of the uh, produce, it's sort of that the policy that has been changing over time, which is leading to the extended producer responsibility. Many of the policymakers start with end of pipe solution, looking at what we can do with point sources, especially the uh, fac uh, factories and how we can reduce emissions from that. The approach taken was very much something called command and control, but gradually, also, we start to have many policies that try to prevent problems at source, 
we also start to take more life cycle thinking oriented approaches. So basically what we can do at the source instead of dealing with the problem at the end. And also we try to find different policies that provide incentives to the uh, producers and uh, other actors so that we can so, uh, incentivize instead of uh, just provide direction as to what to uh, provide command as to what to do. So all in all, we try to seek solutions that could effectively reduce life cycle environmental impacts from different types of products and systems, while also rewarding those industry that is working hard in this direction. So what is extended producer responsibility, which is emerging from this context? This is one of the definitions given by a person called Thomas Lindquist. He happens to be my colleague, longtime colleague, who is also the person who coins the word and provide the first definition of extended producer responsibility. It is a policy principle to promote total life cycle environmental improvements of products by extending the responsibility of the manufacturers of the products to various parts of the entire life cycle of the product. So it could be stretched to different parts of the life cycle and especially to the take back, recycling and final disposal of the products. So in essence, we try to provide that responsibility to the producers instead of just sticking to the uh, responsibility given to them earlier before the product, what happened before was producers are res typically responsible for the products up until they produce and give it and put it on the market. But typically they are not responsible for end of life management. So the idea is that by providing that responsibility to the producers, they start to think about what they can do to change the design of the product so that it is easier to recycle, easier to reuse, easier to basically close the material loops. So we can see that there are two types of policy goals typically found in the EPR-based programs. One is to do with the, the improvement of the system and product design. That is a very important policy goals, which is often forgotten, actually. Often it is considered a sort of people tend to see it as a way of managing waste, but actually it is not that. That is the most, that, that is, um, the uh, sole sol, uh, goal of the uh, EPR, but also very importantly, how we can incentivize producers to change the design. And then another very important issue is that by in, in doing so, we also try to utilize the products and materials by effectively collect the end of life products, sort, sort them from the rest of the waste stream and have a better collection system. Also for the uh, products that are collected, we try to uh, reuse and recycle the uh, materials and products in a better way. And also those that cannot be recycled or reused, we try to have a better environmentally sound treatment. So all, all those things are supposed to contribute to the closure of material loops and circular economy that um, Rafael already highlighted. Also waste prevention, we try to prevent the waste from being generated to start with and only no sustainable production and consumption. As Rafael also mentioned already to an extent, there, there's a big sort of focus at the moment on the uh, circular economy, also waste prevention. So EPR has been very much highlighted again as policy means to promote waste prevention. And it's, it's not only in the area of the uh, electronics, but also products like textiles. And also the circular economy package has been very much focusing on producer responsibility and how we can change the current system in such a way that we have better possibility of closing the material loops. So especially in relation to the waste framework directive that has been revised, the current one is available from 2008 and there was a big revision that was uh, proposed and finalized in 2018. And that is that they, they talk about some specific sort of requirements related to EPR systems. One is to do with a clear allocation of responsibility to relevant actors, target setting, 
reporting, reporting systems should be established in a better way. And also they talk about the operational mechanisms of something called producer responsibility organization, which is the organization that typically take over the responsibility of producers in, uh, in relation to what kind of responsibility they get. So for instance, collection and most typically recycling, take back recycling and reuse and what kind of financial mechanisms should be used. So, and then before going further with this, I'd like to stress that EPR systems, in a nutshell, all are different, both in terms of design and also implementation. And I try to illustrate that a little bit now. So what we have in Europe, what we are going to talk about in the next set of the uh, talk is one thing, but it, it is not only, it, there's no need to, and there's actually the, 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 uh, the way it has been implemented and designed is very, very different for different types of products and different types of, in different countries. So these are the example of EPR based policy instruments. I sort of divide them into three different ones and we don't go in through the details now, but just to highlight that there are different sets of instruments that could be used under the EPR based uh, EPR programs and based on the combination and so forth, the way it appears in the end would be very different. Also the range of responsibility given to the producers in terms of type of responsibility, which often are divided between physical, financial and informative responsibility, but also which part of the, uh, the end of life phase they are responsible for, also differs quite a lot between different programs not only between Europe and the rest, but within European countries. So please keep that in mind. That is one of the very important issues when we talk about producer responsibility. So there are different issues you can think about when we design EPR programs, like all the way from who are the producers, what kind of products we should cover, what kind of target we should set, allocation of responsibility, especially in relation to collection, what kind of funding mechanisms should be used, what kind of things we should think about in relation to existing actors, what kind of people are there already in the, in the field to do the collection of recycling and how we may jeopardize their interest when we introduce EPR and what does that mean for the eff eff effective implementation of EPR program. We should also think about, especially in relation to collection, the convenience as well as incentives to, of the consumers also information provided to them and potentially sanctions that could be given to them to enhance the effective collection. We should also from the producer side, think about free, free riders, monitoring, export, etc. And finally, should the EPR program be mandatory or voluntary? Each one of those points would warrant a discussion of an hour, so we are not going to get into the details, but just to highlight that there are many different issues one can think about when introducing EPR programs. What kind of product that has been subject to EPR, packaging, cars, batteries, and tires, among others, uh, the sort of the typical product that has been under EPR programs, and electrical and electronic equipments. Also, um, we have other products like paints and newsprints and pharmaceuticals coming up. In the EU, we have waste electrical and electronic equipment directive that is specifically addressing electronics. We probably don't need to go through this in details, but as uh, Raphael highlighted, uh, there are different sort of critical materials inside of the EP, uh, sort of electronics. We also have hazardous substances that needs to be taken care of. We have very complex structure we also have um, uh, the issue of the electronics being very much um, varying from one to the other. So there, therefore there are different problems in relation to treatment and disposal. We also have seen high increase of waste volume due to the rapid advancement of technology and also society becoming more affluent. And not uh, last but not least also there the communication between upstream and downstream hasn't been particularly good. So we need to deal with those different issues and producers perhaps are in the best place to take care of this. 
we have different legislation coming up uh, or has been in place. We have in Europe three EU directives, not only we, but other two directives. Also Switzerland and Norway has their own legislation. In Asia, as you can see, there are many countries that have legislation in place. Also, in, sorry, <laughs> India is appearing twice, but India is already having its legislation and Thailand and uh, in the, Indonesia, sorry, is another country that is in the process of developing the legislation. We also have seen development in America. So just to highlight that there are different parts of the world working on this issue and has system in place. Um, when it comes to the EU we directive, we have been having the, uh, the legislation in place since 2002. It is among the different legislation in Europe that covers specific waste streams. So for instance, there are other legislation for packaging and cars and so forth. So electronics is one of them. And that came together with another directive called Roche Directive, Restriction of the Use of Hazardous Substances in 2002. And then there was a whole revision that take place in 2012 based on different experiences accumulated. Uh, in the implementation of the original directive. So some of the changes include the electronic categories, collection targets, preparation for reuse target was introduced, and also the enhancement of targets for recycling and recovery. So in the next round, we are going to talk much about this and it should come in a second. Just to highlight that there are different studies we have been working on and the, the one in the middle at the bottom extended producer responsibility in a known OECD context. This is the study we did especially looking at the situation in India. So for anyone interested I'm happy to send you the link and perhaps there are many other things we have been trying to do in this area. So uh, Shall I continue on with the WE directive now, or should we take a pause? Uh, please continue. Please continue. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So I go to the next one, and that is to do with the WE directive. So the WE directive has specific policy goals, uh, very similar to what I mentioned in relation to the EPR program. So the main uh, sort of stated objective is the contribution to sustainable production and consumption, but also waste prevention by improving design, improved recovery process and reuse and recycling. Um, efficient use of resources is also mentioned, and the um, also improvement of the environmental performance of different industries involved, especially in relation to the treatment operators. And, and finally, as it is in EU, we, the, uh, there is also intention to reduce the disparities between different member states' legislation. So what does that say? We, we start by talking about the different types of electronics and where does this uh, polar, uh, solar panels come in. We have different types of electronics and up until 2018, last year in August, uh, August last year, the categorization is based on 10. So all the way from large and small household appliances to automatic dispensers to toys and so forth. So you can see that it's a very broad categories of waste that we UV directive is covering. The type categorized just categorization changed as of last year. And now, now you can see that it is much slimmer. It's only six different categories. But when you look into the details of what is covered by those two uh, different ways of categorization, actually the products that are covered is essentially the same but it is different way of categorization. And the reason for that is mainly to do with what is happening in rea reality in relation to collection. So for instance, the large appliances has been typically collected together with other automatic, uh, large appliances like automatic dispensers and some of the consumer equipment and so forth, but they are in the original directive divided into several 
categories. And so what the policymaker is for the implement the, the, the policy had to do in the different member states was to divide the uh, what is collected together into different streams and check how much constitute the large appliances, how much is automatic dispensers and so forth, which doesn't really help the um, environment, but create that more ad administrative work. So they kind of change this categorization. When we talk about the solar cells, the two sort of categorizers we see the, in the original directive, it is under category four. In the new sort of categorization, it is under the large equipment and small equipment. And on top of that, you divide those different type of electronic waste into new or historic waste, and also how those generated from household or business. So the responsibility given to different actors is, let's say, starting from the collection. Retailers are given specific responsibility, free of charge, separate collection from households based on old for new basis. So we can ask ourselves what happens to the rest, what, what happens to the products that, are, uh, that is not the replacement product, but uh, for instance, if you are moving from one place to another and you want to just get rid of it, what do you do? And I come back to that in a minute. This responsibility is supposed to be given to the retailers, but also it gives uh, the directive give possibility for member states to sort of divert from this responsibility. So there are zillions of different solutions coming up. Additional requirement given to retailers as of the uh, 2012 directive was that if the retailers uh, square meters more than 40 square meters, 400, sorry, square meters, they have to provide a free of charge collection of very small we. So many of the PV cells that you use on the uh, sort of uh, as a solar panels probably on this roof won't come into this, but those that are integrated in the small electronics may come into this. Then you have to re receive those uh, electronics free of charge regardless of the new purchase. So that's a new requirement coming from 2012. And then producers are supposed to set up collection system for those generated from business. Just to reiterate that there are different solutions coming up uh, for the collection because of the uh, diff sort of possibility of allocating responsibility to different actors. So this is from uh, the, uh, the implementation of from the 2002 directive, but you can see that very diverse solution was implemented by different member states. When it comes to the targets given to in relation to the collection, up until 2015, there was a four kilograms per person per year target from private household. From 2016 on, there's a new different way of setting the target coming up. So it is based on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, how much you put uh, on the market and in the, the previous three years and that, constitute the denominator and you divide the total waste weight we collected with that number. And as up until 2019, you should collect 45%. From 2019 onwards, it should be 65% and more. Another possibility is to go for 85% of the we generated and the uh, that is uh, generated overall. And that is another way for the member states to go for. At the moment, there has, uh, there has been different criticism given to this because this is regardless of the change from the four kilograms target to the percentage target, it is based on weight. And that what that means, and it is not based on the specific waste stream, it is overall waste generated. So what happened in reality is that those who are responsible for collection tend to go for large equipment and heavy equipment instead of, for instance, mobile phones that are small and light. So that's one of the big issues related to this collection target. And also another issue that has been raised and also very relevant for the, uh, the uh, recycling and reuse of the uh, solar panels is that the collection, the quality of collection influenced very much the reuse and recycling potentials afterwards. This is just to provide a general overview of the collection rate per capita provided uh, for the uh, electronics uh, 
in the that in which the PV panels is belonging to. This is a, it is very we don't have any specific figures for the PV panels. This is together with the consumer electronics. So difficult to say, but as uh, the introductory remark talked about, Sweden is one of the front runners when it comes to collection, whether it is good or not, is another question because it is also in relation to how much is put on the market. But uh, this is the current situation, including both the PV panels and the uh, consumer equipment. And what we have seen so far is the PV panels within this is very, very small. When it comes to the responsibility, the, the take back and material recovery is the, uh, the producers, where the producer responsibility really kicks in. So basically producers are responsible for setting up the system for take back recovery and treatment. There is a proper treatment done and also achievement of preparation for reuse, recycling and recovery targets, which is differentiated for product groups and based on what was collected. This is the target relevant for the PV panels. So from the 15th of August 2018 onwards, for the large equipment, recovery target is 85%. So as compared to what the introductory speaker talked about, uh, there's a, uh, if the Indian situation is about 2% at the moment, there's quite a big way to go. Because out of that, the 80% the needs to be met with the preparation for reuse or recycling target. Just for the qualification recovery in the, the uh, European law uh, sort of context means the uh, both material recovery, uh, recycling, preparation and for reuse and energy re recovery. So basically what it says is 80% of the uh, large equipment that has been collected needs to be either material recycled or prepared for reuse. And only 5% is allowed for energy recovery and the rest you do proper treatment. So financial responsibility is another important part of the EPR program, and I would argue it is part of the EPR. For the new products that is put on the market after, basically the products put on the market after the original directive came into force in full, which is the 13th of August, 2005, individual responsibility kicks in, meaning that producers who put their products themselves, they are the one responsible for their own products. So Sony is responsible for Sony's products, Siemens is responsible for Siemens, etc. But they have the possibility of joining the collective schemes when it comes to the physical uh, management of the products. Historical products, basically those products that are put before that date, 13th of August 2005, that could be done together, but for the solar panels, basically it is the individual responsibility that needs to be, uh, that is a norm. When it comes to non-household waste for the new, again, it is the producers who are supposed to be responsible for financing this. And there also the informative responsibility is also given to the producers. It is the marking of new products. Information should be given to the recycling and treatment facilities, very important part. And also there the companies as well as the products put on the market needs to be registered. So those are the sort of different elements related to the WE directive. Some important thing to remember that was first when it comes to e, the electronics in general, there are very different national laws and implementation that I also mentioned earlier. There is also a very strong highlight that has been pushed in relation to circular economy. So the reuse of electronics is particularly encouraged among different product streams to be enhanced under the waste framework directive. So in addition to reuse, uh, recycling, where EPR programs to date tend to focus on, there should be more focus on reuse and that has been pushed from different directions. So that means also for the PV industry, there could be a competition 
between the reuse and recycling sector and that we have seen already in Europe. I think you will hear more about it probably from the next round of the web webinar, but that's something that should be kept in mind. Um, at the moment, as Raphael already mentioned, it, it, the collection has been rather low. So it is something we are waiting to happen to an extent in the future. Um, also, when it comes to the collection and the uh, reuse, there has been uh, sort of voices coming up that national laws regarding the buildings might influence this because unlike other electronics that is used inside of the house, typically PV solar panels uh, tend to be on the roof or other outdoor spaces. And that means that uh, other legislation related to buildings tend to come in. And for instance, in some of the member states, the, uh, the way you can change the outer part of the building uh, requires specific permission and so forth. And that may hinder some of the activities related to reuse of the uh, PV panels. Also, there's one final, uh, finally, the uh, Eco Design Directive. Uh, that is the third legislation related to electronics. There's a design the, uh, requirements coming up, especially for the PV cells. The, the uh, discussion is under, uh, ongoing at the moment, and it is expected to sort of come into the come into force by the uh, by the end of this year. So that's something that also the PV industry needs to keep in mind. So it was a very quick and rushed presentation, but any questions, you're very welcome to contact me. And now we have hopefully some minutes to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tojo, uh, very much. I think that uh, it was uh, quite impressive to, uh, to learn how, how much uh, uh, waste is already recycled in uh, Europe, and um, I I think that uh, uh, the data which I have provided uh, uh, is actually a bit misleading. I uh, I already put slide showing that only two percent of the waste here in India is collected e-waste, but I believe that it's much more but not necessarily uh, it will uh, be related to uh, PV solars. Uh, actually, in, uh, I noticed that in India, uh, 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 people used to repair things. So they collect, repair, and use much longer than we are using in Europe. So actually, uh, <laughs> India is much more ecological where, than uh, uh, Europeans are. And we have to uh, keep it in mind that even such data should be uh, read carefully. Uh, but it was my own data, so I, I'm sorry that this is just self-correction. Uh, and right now, I would like to re read uh, questions which are, or maybe Marina, please. I, I cannot see this question, so if you don't mind, please read uh, questions to uh, Mr. Uh, Rafael Ross first. So, uh, Mr. Rafael, we have got a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is by an anonymous attendee, and he's asking that what is the classification of CRM according to the EO report on critical raw materials? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, maybe a clarification, first of all. So, the um, the European Commission has made a list which is regularly updated of what is defined as critical raw materials and the latest one is from 2017. Um, and what is important to highlight is that, yes, there is a methodology to, to determine what are critical raw materials and this comes from uh, the, uh, the slide that I presented earlier and there comprises the full list of, of CRM according to the latest definition. But what, what is important to highlight is that CRMs are not necessarily rare materials. So falling under the CRM list indicates that the material is key for strategic and industrial purposes, uh, specifically for innovative technologies such as, such as renewables um, technologies. Um, 
And CRMs can therefore can be classified as such, not just for scarce availability in nature, but also for um, mining and extracting or processing and refining. And notably, this, this affects solar with the silicon, for instance, because the, the element per se, silicon, is, is very abundant in the Earth's crust. It's actually the second uh, most abundant element in the, in the Earth's crust after oxygen. Uh, silicon metal is the dirtier form that is produced uh, preferably from quartz, um, which is the pure form of, of silicon that is naturally available, and it's mined for this purpose. So uh, our understanding is that... Um, the availability of clean enough quartz is, 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 is the reason for rating silicon metal as a CRM. Uh, but yes, so just, just want to, to highlight that it's not necessarily a, a, a rare or a, or a valuable element, but more that is strategically important, as, as opposed to silver, for instance. Silver is not considered a crit critical raw materials, but we include it in, in, our, in our discussion because it's clearly a, a rare metal with, with high value, and for this reason is included. Uh, thanks, Rafael. Uh, I have one other question, but I would request you to just be brief. Uh, this question is being asked by Mr. Rajneesh, and I'm sure that this question comes to almost uh, uh, all the minds of the attendees, that why to introduce PV recycling if there is no PV waste today? Yes, um, that's, that's a, actually a good point, but I want to highlight that there is not like there is no waste at all. There is some waste. It, it is limited but it's, it's, it's there and it's ever growing. Um, if you consider that there are early retirements and early failures, that there are some, to some extent, some, some PV waste. And so in order to unlock the benefits of, of, of recycling industry, uh, the institutional groundwork must be prepared in time. Uh, so this is the reason I would say it's, uh, it's, it's important to, to be ready to having system tests ahead uh, that can also help understand how the system can be improved and how can be best designed. Yeah, one should also keep in mind that there is no one size fits all system. So it is, it's important to practically test uh, uh, an, an EPR system in, uh, in, in the country. Um, yeah. So, but, but if, you, if you wish to know more about this, I think like in the next webinar, we will look at, uh, at PV recycling from an industry perspective where, where we have uh, a clearer look of how much uh, waste streams are actually there at the moment. Wait a moment. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, also, if we have questions to uh, Professor Naoko, Toto, please uh, read them. Sure. Uh, Naoko, actually, owing to short, shortage of time, I'm just going to ask one question uh, to you. The first one that was again asked by some anonymous attendee that why PV waste is a part of e-waste in Europe? Okay, I think, uh, well, it's, they are using, I think uh, they are using similar materials as the rest of the electronics and it is used, uh, the, uh, the, it is to do with the definition of we, and uh, I think the, the PV the, the, the PV falls under that, and it's a little bit related to what uh, uh, Raphael just mentioned. I, I think it is also to make sure that that is taken care of together with the uh, the rest of the uh, electronics. I mean, whether it should be covered and taken care of in the same waste. Same, same way as the rest of the electronics, I think it's another question. And I think already we have seen the development of a different setup for the PV waste. But it is to do with how electronic waste is defined in Europe. Thank you, Thank you very much. So uh, I have to say that even from, from last words, I, I learned something very new. I thought that uh, actually the uh, uh, existing infrastructure for processing uh, EU waste can be easily used for processing of PV, PV waste, but uh, uh, Professor Tojo said that there is some consideration about, uh, pre uh, let's say, segregation of the stream of the, of the waste and using different technologies. So I think that we should really Actually, we would like to uh, investigate it further and show 
Uh, why? Be because th this is something what uh, pr probably such an infrastructure will grow in uh, India and uh, arguments should be presented if it's uh, possible. So thank you very much. Uh, right now I would like to give uh, floor to, uh, to the ministry. Maybe you have some questions. If, if not, we can, uh, we can close uh, this part of the, uh, of the webinar. See, actually, uh, less of questions and more of issues, which I would like to flag now for which we need to get answers in future. It's true that in India still, PV does not come under e-waste, not been defined as such. We have made a draft PV recycling policy, which Ministry of Environment may issue any time now. We don't know because they are going through a series of consultations, technical and stakeholders. But some issues we need to address. Uh, one thing first is that not only looking at waste, uh, the way the PV design itself should be changed so that the, we, need, we get to get more recyclable materials in the PV structure itself. So that the waste generation, this waste disposal is not a major issue 35 years from now, as you say. That is one issue perhaps our research scientists are supposed to be working to make the various components which go into a PV structure, including the uh, structures, uh, become more recyclable. So instead of things which has to be disposed of, whether this can be recycled. And he, as Marik said that India has a culture of recycling things. Even uh, pens and uh, this thing we tend to recycle, take out and you put a new, new item inside it start writing it. The similar thing, if you can work, it will suit to the India's culture of recycling things. Second, we need to have a proper business models which makes recycling as such a profitable one. Forget about technical part. Technical part is important. Yeah. We have to work on that. A business model which makes recycling, we see, it can't be pushed. But why is there such so much low percentage of recycling even in Europe? Because it has not become viable enough so that the business itself is not pushing it. If it becomes viable enough, the business itself will be pushing it. So it has to be, instead of being pushed through regulations, it can be pushed through through money. Money drives much better than a regulation. Third, since we are regulatory atmosphere is now, does not consider the recycling of photovoltaic, we like to look into various models in various countries on this recycling of photovoltaic, which are effective ones, which can be brought in. A policy will come in, but we'll keep on doing it. So these are the three issues I wanted to flag, and perhaps we can find answers and features on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, the additional secretary uh, uh, of the ministry, a person who is actually in charge uh, of uh, PV uh, market development. So it's, it's great that he or, he's already aware about such things and hopefully we can provide some input. Uh, of course, uh, uh, what we can do, we can only provide you some examples, some analysis, some reports, uh, uh, and we are just happy to, uh, to do whatever you, uh, you require. Uh, maybe, if you don't mind, sir, I will give a floor for two minutes to uh, actually my boss, uh, Edwin Cuckoo. Why should uh, I mind? Why should <laughs> I mind? <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, Edwin from a uh, councillor from European Commission, uh, the uh, councillor of energy and climate change. Yes. Thank you very much. And I should say that also Smita Singh is here, who's actually your real boss and coordinating sure, your, 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 your project. So, <laughs> so um, for us, this uh, a series of webinars is very important. Uh, we are very keen on cooperating with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in the area of renewable energy. Uh, we agree with uh, one of the presenters that uh, solar energy will be uh, uh, the backbone of the new energy system and we were working together with India, India in the area of uh, rooftop solar, solar parks and now also uh, uh, recycling. Um, 
indeed, in the long term, there will be a very significant uh, volume of waste. Uh, and I also agree with the comment that perhaps it's, it's very sensible to now already also look at the currently still small amount of waste and to learn from it and to be ready. Um, um, one of the speakers mentioned it's a long term big challenge, but I think the, the time to act is sort of now. So in the short in the short term, I think it was really useful to learn more about uh, the different uh, EU legislation, um, the waste electrical and then electronic equipment legislation, which provides targets in Europe. Uh, and the targets that were mentioned were that from 2018 onwards, onwards, 85% of the solar panels need to be recovered in Europe and 80% recycled. So we learned about the restriction of hazardous substances in electronic waste. We learned about uh, the waste framework directive, the critical raw uh, materials. And also it was very useful to learn more about uh, uh, extended producer responsibility and also the financial responsibility of producers. I think that's also an important uh, concept. So, so once again, many thanks for this webinar and I'm really looking forward to the uh, upcoming uh, webinars on this very important issue. Yes. Thank you very much. So hereby I'm closing this webinar and uh, hopefully we will hear uh, or see each other soon. Uh, we don't have exact date of the next webinar, but uh, uh, it has to be uh, in uh, one month because this is the time given us by the secretary. We have to deliver it every month. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. I would like to uh, once more thank uh, to all participants from internet. We've got uh, already more than 200 uh, participants, so it's quite a substantial uh, uh, number, especially when we are talking about some quite karmatical uh, issue. This is not fascinating for everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, uh, are we already? On or not? We are yeah, on. Yeah. I said that uh, instead of a pure webinar, next time we can have a webinar come seminar. What will happen? Instead of only five of us sitting here, all the stakeholders who are really involved sure. can be called here. So their participation can be upfront. And even the web participants can continue. It will be done. Ah, so, so that will be a combined thing. So that uh, more number of people can see the reactions and immediate reactions can come. And, and the web participants have add value anyway. So sure. Add Sir, it was kind of an experiment. Yeah. We, uh, if we could uh, expect that we will not fall down, we, uh, for sure we can invite other people. But we like to have we, some solar power developers. Sure, sure, sure. It would they be great. Sitting here. They may not log in on their own. Yeah. But they are busy people. When you call them, they will be here. So they will hear. They will get to know what is to be done and not. So, internauts, you will be invited to the ministry. This is good news. Thank you. Bye. Uh, uh, I just would like to...